Hello and welcome to the Oncology Podcast, an Australian oncology perspective. For more info and to sign up to our weekly newsletter, visit our website, oncologynews.com.au. Thanks for listening. Hello, this is Rachel Babin from the Oncology Podcast. Welcome to this wonderful special edition of the Oncology Journal Club. This week we have our first post-ASCO 2020 review episode, hosted by the brilliant Professor Eva Segaloff from Monash University. Eva is a medical oncologist and director of medical oncology at Monash Health in Melbourne, Australia. As usual, she is joined by Dr. Craig Underhill from Albury Wodongo, who interviews one of the plenary presenters from ASCO 2020, lung cancer expert Professor Natasha Leo from the Princess Margaret Cancer Centre in Toronto. Eva also gives us an in-depth expert analysis of Keynote 355 and tells us why you need to watch out for monoclonal payloads. Also this week, Eva and Professor Hans Prennan from Belgium present some of their winners and losers from ASCO 2020. With the usual knockabout banter between our awesome presenters, you are in for a great episode of the Oncology Journal Club. As ever, the links to all of the papers discussed today are available in the notes. This is Rachel Babin, and this is the Oncology Podcast. Hello, and welcome to our special post, ASCO Oncology Journal Club podcast. And for those of you whose eyes are completely zoomed out, all you need to do is listen to this episode, and you'll hear all the latest and greatest up from ASCO. So it's a pleasure to welcome back the wonderful Hans Prennan. Hi, Eva. As usual, I'm very pleased to be here today again. And the wonderful Craig Underhill. Hello, Craig. Hi, Eva. How are you doing? Good. And look, I really enjoyed watching ASCO with you on our Zoom party, although at times the wine description was more interesting than the trials. Yeah, that's right. I mean, like a lot of people, we got together with a group of friends and watched it at the same time, which was fun but we were dogged a little bit by some of the technical issues from the ESCO website. So I think, you know, we haven't quite got to the reality that we can replace being there with watching it on a virtual ESCO, but I guess watching those presentations was better than not watching it at all. Yes, and the two times button was particularly helpful. Hans, how did you go in Belgium? I think it was maybe the most nerdiest Zoom party I've ever done, but it was quite interesting to follow this uh, ASCO by Zoom. And we've just heard that ESMO will also be virtual, so uh, it'll be a while before we get to uh, sit in a, a big meeting again. So for that very reason, you may not have covered all the key abstracts and got all the key information for ASCO. So over these next few Oncology Journal podcasts, we'll bring you some key findings, some special guest interviews with key trialists. And of course, we're going to finish up with the winners and losers section from ASCO. So Eva, I understand you're going to lead off with a breast cancer topic before we get on to the main event, which is moi interviewing Natasha Lale from Toronto. But I, I think you're going to tell us about Keynote 355, a randomized double blind phase three study, pembrolizumab and chemo versus placebo and chemo for previously untreated, locally recurrent, inoperable metastatic triple negative breast cancer. Yes, I wanted to discuss with you Javier Cortez's presentation of Keynote 355. Our breast cancer colleagues, like some of us in GI, have been searching for a role for the checkpoint inhibitors for some time. And of course, triple negative breast cancer is an area of huge need for new effective therapies. So in this trial, patients were randomised two to one in the first line setting for either metastatic or recurrent inoperable triple negative breast cancer. Now, there are dual primary endpoints in this study, PFS, which was presented at ASCO, and OS, which has not yet been presented, each by tumour PDL1 expression with two groups, CPS more than or equal to 10 and more than or equal to 1, and then all patients. So the results of this trial, which were keenly awaited, showed that in the group who had a CPS greater than or equal to 10 
for PDL one the impact of Pembro plus chemo versus placebo plus chemotherapy on progression-free survival was a difference from 9.7 months to 5.6 months in favour of the addition of Pembro. At six months, the PFS was 65% versus 46.9%. And at 12 months, 39% versus 23%. So that was highly statistically significant with a hazard ratio of 0.65, range 0.49 to 0.86. For the group of patients, around about 600 patients, with CPS greater than equal to one, there was less of an effect. And although the hazard ratio was 0.74 and range 0.61 to 0.9, this did not reach the predetermined progression-free survival for this group. Nevertheless, there was a difference between the curves and that was also seen in the intention to treat population. So just to summarise, although the boundary for a statistically significant benefit for Pembro plus chemo in patients with CPS greater than one tumours was not met and the formal testing in ITT was not performed, the Pembro effect did increase with PDL one enrichment. Treatment-related AEs and immune-related AEs were as you would expect and the trial concluded that Pembro plus chemotherapy resulted in a statistically significant and clinically meaningful improvement in PFS versus chemo alone for first-line treatment of PD-L1 positive metastatic triple negative breast cancer with CPS greater than or equal to 10 with a trend in the greater than or equal to 1 group. Safety was consistent with known profiles And the conclusion was made that there is a role in standard therapy for the addition of pembrolizumab. Thank you, Eva, for this nice overview. So I have a question about it. Do you think that this trial will change our practice in how we treat triple negative breast cancer? And if yes, should we stick to the ones with a very high CPS score over 10? Or do you still think that somebody with a lower CPS can still have benefit from immune therapy? Really good questions, Hans. We're really desperate for some better treatments in triple negative breast cancer. Looking at the curves, no one was alive at 36 months. And after 24 months, only 32 patients were alive out of 566, even with this treatment. So better treatments are certainly needed. I think this trial provides evidence that Pembro is active with chemotherapy I think this trial provides evidence that CPS is not a perfect predictor and we have many more pieces of the puzzle that we need to look at. One of the issues with breast cancer, of course, is sequential treatment. But these patients are not ones where we can wait for many lines of therapy down the track to give our IO. So I would think this would be adopted fairly quickly into clinical practice where the IO is available. And another question, because you remember our podcast from before, we spoke about colon cancer and then we said in the neoadjuvant setting that patients with their MSI high had a very good response, as you know. And you also know that there is data in the neoadjuvant treatments in breast cancer with immune therapy with very high pathological complete responses. So do you think that we should move earlier to the treatment with immune therapy and that there is a difference between metastatic disease and between locally advanced disease? There are certainly many trials in the neoadjuvant space and there was data presented at ASCO as well as previous about a higher path CR with the use of immunotherapy and really to stop people dying from this disease, that's what we are going to need. We still need better predictive markers and this whole story of IOs in in every disease and how they work on in situ tumours versus metastatic tumours versus adjuvantly is going to be linked to the immune system, the tumour microenvironment and the reaction within the body as well as the concurrent therapy. We had data at ASCO about adding SABRE and looking at response with IO. So there are many, many permutations and we certainly, I think, need to improve on these results. 
and we will with the whole suite of trials coming through. So it's a great pleasure to welcome Natasha Lale from the Princess Margaret Cancer Centre in Toronto. And we're going to talk about some exciting abstracts from the lung sessions at the virtual ASCO meeting. So welcome, Natasha. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks so much, Craig. It's a pleasure to be here. So it was quite an exciting year for lung cancer at ASCO. So we're going to cover a little bit in the IO space, non-small cell lung cancer. We'll talk briefly about some small cell abstracts and then touch on targeted therapy as well. So first up, we'll talk about advanced um, metastatic non-small cell lung cancer and the three oral papers which are trying to define the role of IO in this tumour. So firstly, Natasha, I guess we should talk about, um, before we get to your stunning paper, we'll talk about Checkmate 227 study. Thanks, Craig. So this year at ASCO, uh, Suresh Ramalingam from Emory presented the three-year update of the Checkmate 227 study. And people who follow the lung cancer literature will remember that this is a complex trial in both PDL1 positive and negative patients. And they looked at nivolumab plus ipilimumab, chemotherapy, and then patients were also randomized to a third arm, depending on whether they were positive or negative, either to nivolumab alone or nivolumab plus chemotherapy in patients with PDL1 negative disease. And, and what he showed us was that. The findings that we saw earlier where nivolumab and ipilimumab uh, was superior to chemotherapy, this was really maintained at the three-year follow-up. So the three-year survival in patients that were pdl one positive with nivolumab and ipilimumab was 33%, 22% with chemotherapy, and nevo alone was in between. And in pdl one negative patients, very similar numbers. Uh, a three-year survival of 34%, again, about 22% with chemo alone. Uh, and Nevo plus chemo, I think a little surprisingly, didn't do quite as well and was much closer to the chemotherapy arm. Patients did have more toxicity with nivolumab and ipilimumab, but it, does, it did seem manageable. And so, you know, I think this really adds yet another regimen to our armamentarium. We have immunotherapy alone with pembrolizumab in pdl one strongly positive patients. We have immunotherapy plus chemotherapy across, across a range of uh, subtypes and pdl one uh, expression groups. And now we have nivolumab and nivolumab. So I think this really uh, supported that. So at the end, I'm going to try and um, push you on what the paradigm should be now or, or what the choices are in the different subgroups. So mm -hmm. after we discuss the papers, we'll, we'll come back and talk a little bit about that. They also trumpeted that people in the responders, there was quite a, a marked difference between the patients who received IO versus the chemotherapy alone. But I'm not really sure how valid that analysis is in the real world. So one of the things that they did in this presentation was they presented a landmark analysis where they asked the question, you know, if you had a response, uh, whether you were PDL1 positive or PDL1 negative, was it the same quality of response? And, and these are subject to bias, you know, they're highly selected yeah. for you and I in clinic. They're kind of irrelevant, you know, we just want to know how our patient's going to do for all comers rather than those that we know will respond or not respond. So, so it's, it's a little artificial, but I think what they showed was that whether you had PDL1 negative or positive disease, if you had a response from nivolumab and ipilimumab, you were going to do very, very well either way and better than, than you would do on chemotherapy. So that, that's what that showed. I think we already know that. So I, I'm not sure that that landmark analysis added a lot. Yep. Thank you very much, Natasha. Then we're going to move on to the Checkmate 9LA study, which was presented, I think, for the first time. Slightly different chemotherapy. This time it was a carboplatin or cisplatin paclitaxel plus or minus maintenance pemetrexate for the patients receiving chemotherapy, which could be four cycles in the chemotherapy alone arm or the addition after only two cycles of chemotherapy, the nivolumab and IPI. And again, just for, we have quite a few trainees in the audience. This is the, this is the low dose EP. This is not the same dose of EP that we traditionally have used in Australia with melanoma patients. So again, looking to answer the question of whether adding nevo EP to chemo is superior. And I think this was actually a fascinating trial because what we've seen across a lot of the immunotherapy studies is that in the first two to three months, a lot of patients do very badly on immunotherapy alone. And so the question that was asked in this study was, can we add a little chemo, 
get patients past that initial hump, that initial decline or falling off the cliff, so to speak, um, and then see how they do after that. And, and I think the investigators uh, achieved a couple of things. First of all, they showed better survival, significantly improved survival, when uh, patients received nivolumab and ibilimumab uh, on an ongoing basis with that initial two cycles of chemotherapy versus chemotherapy alone. Um, the updated uh, analysis showed a hazard ratio of 0.66, a median survival of 15.6 months with immunotherapy, uh, plus a little chemotherapy versus 10.9 months with chemotherapy alone, uh, and a one-year survival of 63% compared to 47%. And, and they achieved their objective. They, you actually see a very early separation of the curve. So, so this worked. I also think this is a confirmatory study for Checkmate 227 because you do see that nivolumab and ipilimumab does outperform chemotherapy. Um, so even though there was a little chemo up front to allow that separation of the curve, I think this study is more evidence that this is a regimen with some legs, so to speak, That's in the advanced right. non-small cell lung cancer space. It is interesting that when we looked at patients less likely to benefit, it was older patients and also patients that were never smokers. So I think this is still a group where immunotherapy by itself where immunotherapy as the mainstay remains a real question that we need to sort out. Yeah. The other interesting thing for me was that the results seem to hold up regardless of the pd one status of the patient, whereas in the past we've tried to stratify according to that. I agree. And I think this is very interesting, you know, this concept that with the combination of checkpoint inhibitors, pdl one expression by itself is no longer as important. And this is the second trial now where we've seen this, that, uh, that this combination works uh, across PDL one uh, subgroups similar to immunotherapy plus chemotherapy. Great. So two studies looking at the addition of IO to chemo, and now slight change of gear, the study that you presented, BR34. So really looking at the question of, do we need chemotherapy at all? Can we just give IO or just adding chemo add benefit? So Natasha, do you want to tell us a little bit about this study? So this study was very interesting, and we were delighted from the uh, Canadian Cancer Trials Group to participate with the Australasian Lung Cancer Trials Group on this. And Craig, you were a, a lead accruer and star investigator. Thank you so much for all of the Australian contribution. What was interesting about this trial is that there's no standard arm. This was this is really a trial that's still ahead of its time. We had envisioned when we designed it that combination immunotherapy would be a standard. Uh, today in 2020, and I think we're almost there. And so we added chemotherapy to dravalumab and tremulimumab. Everyone got dravalumab and tremulimumab, and this was first-line treatment. Uh, and what we found was that overall survival actually was not improved. The hazard ratio was 0.88, 16.6 months with the combination, 14.1 with immunotherapy alone. Progression-free survival was better, but you would expect this when you're giving all of the different treatments up front uh, versus a sequential approach. And response rate was also doubled when you added chemotherapy to dravalumab and tremolimumab. Just like we saw in the earlier Checkmate studies, pdl one expression did not modulate outcomes. So it didn't matter whether patients had pdl one high expression or low expression by any cutoff. There was no difference in survival when we added chemotherapy to dravalumab and tremolimumab, and really no difference in the progression-free survival benefit that we saw consistently across groups. Where we did start to see differences emerging, though, was looking at blood-based TMB, and that was measured using the Garden Omni assay. And in previous studies, we've seen that patients with high blood-based TMB might be more likely to benefit from dravalumab and tremolimumab. In our study, patients with high blood-based TMB, a cutoff of 20 mutations per megabase or higher, had much longer survival than those with low blood-based TMB. And that was irrespective of treatment arms. So really in our study, it was prognostic. It was associated with outcome irrespective of treatment. But it's a very interesting signal. You know, is this a group of patients where combination immunotherapy is very important? And then, of course, the question remains, do we need chemotherapy at all in this group? In those with the low TMB arm, it was clear that progression-free survival was better when you added chemotherapy up front. And again, that was irrespective of pd one expression being high or low. So, so overall in our study, you know, we found that adding chemotherapy to combination checkpoint inhibition did not improve survival. As expected, it did improve progression-free survival and response rate. And the groups that in particular seem to derive the most benefit were uh, those that you would expect, those with lower blood-based TMB, those where you might think that immunotherapy by itself 
might be less active. And again, PDL1 was not predictive of benefit in this combination immunotherapy study, just like in the checkmate studies. So, do you think is this an early look, or with further follow up, we might see a difference in overall survival? I guess that's question you've probably been asked a few times now. So technically this is the final analysis. Having said that, a lot of our patients are still on treatment. So 18% in the immunotherapy combination arm and 25% in the immunotherapy plus chemotherapy arm. So even though this is the final analysis, I would suspect that we may be able to get some more data out of this uh, and we'll keep working on uh, on both sides of the pond uh, to see if we can get an updated look in the future. And I saw one of the questions in the posed by the discussant was you know, is tremulimumab, tevilimumab different to ipinevo? Do you think that has legs or? So I think it's a real challenge. And I think it's not so much the question of tevilimumab as a question of tremulimumab. Uh, and it's been difficult. We don't have any direct comparative studies of CTLA-4 inhibitors. We know from the MYSTIC trial that tevilimumab and tremulimumab was not superior to chemotherapy, whereas in the Checkmate 227 trial and now 9LA, nivolumab and ipilimumab has shown superiority to chemotherapy. So we don't have that same wealth of positive data, but there are other studies still coming. Um, and so I think I think at this point, I would wait on making uh, direct comparative conclusions. I think there's still more data to come. So where are we now then, do you think, with advanced non-small cell lung cancer, Natasha, in the past, the, up until now, I guess the paradigm is about patients with high PDL1 having a choice between giving them single agent checkpoint inhibitor up front or a combination with chemotherapy. And for the low, really using the combination of chemotherapy and checkpoint inhibitor. And if there's no contraindication in Australia, we're able to give bevacizumab as well. Do you think that stratification based on PDL1 is still valid now? Or do you think the paradigm has, has shifted? on the basis of those presentations at ESCO? So I think that there are two ways to approach this. And one of the great things about lung cancer today is it's never been more confusing, which is really a great thing for our patients. I think that single agent immunotherapy or PD-1 inhibition, for example, with pembrolizumab and emerging data with atezolizumab is a clear option for patients with a strong expression of PDL1, 50% TPS by the PGC3 assay and so forth. So that's a clear option. Yep. Does a combination like nivolumab and ipilimumab outperform that? We don't know. The only data that we have is with nivolumab and ipilimumab versus nivolumab alone in patients with squamous lung cancer, a second line therapy where there was no difference. So two drugs were not better than one. So I, th I think we don't know in that group that's very likely to benefit from a single agent. Definitely for all those with uh, lower PDL1 expression, and you might argue with lower TMB, a combination of chemotherapy and immunotherapy is important and remains a standard. The question now, though, is who should get nivolumab and nivolumab? Who should have combination immunotherapy? And I think the answer is still unclear. We still don't have a comparator to the new standard, nivolumab and nivolumab versus pembrolizumab in those with high expression, and nevo ipi versus immunotherapy plus chemo in those with lower PDL1 expression. One could say it doesn't matter, just treat all your patients the same way, whether it's with chemo IO across all the groups or nevo ipi across all the groups. But I think that that does really lose the potential for us to figure out the the precision, a better precision approach. PDL1 is clearly not enough. Uh, but I think that between that and tumor mutation burden and other emerging markers, we really need to think about who needs what. Who needs how much of what? There, there's still a group of patients that don't need chemotherapy up front, and, and who are they? And uh, and who are the patients where we really need to start with everything up front? And also, you know, who's that group of patients where one drug isn't enough, but perhaps two immunotherapy agencies? So I, I think this is still all in flux. It's still not one size fits all. That's not very helpful. But right now, I wouldn't change our paradigm. And I think the challenge will really be for Nevo Ipi to find its place in this paradigm that we already have. Thank you. So it sounds like more studies needed. And just while quickly while we're in the IO space, I'll mention one phase two study, which was the addition of dovolumumab to standard chemotherapy in patients with 
malignant pleural mesothelioma. The reason for mentioning this is the Australian audience will be interested because we have amongst the highest rates, if not the highest rates of mesothelioma in the world. So this was uh, some provocative data with high response rates in that combination. I think it's very exciting and uh, both the Australian group and uh, our group are participating in a study looking at pembrolizumab and chemotherapy and we're looking forward to some durable outcomes uh, in the near future. And so I think, you know, it's so important in uh, tumor types like this and tumor types like small cell lung cancer you know, how much, how much further can we go with the, with the addition of immunotherapy? Unfortunately, things like survival are still so important. And we also saw that in the plenary, you know, in Canada, Australia, the UK, Europe, survival still matters. And so these are the things that we have to demonstrate in these trials. Great. And so again, while we're on IO, but changing now to small cell lung cancer. So I'm not sure if the immunotherapy drugs are available in Canada, they're reimbursed uh, in extensive stage small cell lung cancer. They are in Australia now for tezolizumab, which was, you know, trumpeted with a two-month survival difference. You talked about survival matters, the two-month benefit. This is reimbursed now and hailed as the biggest advance in small cell lung cancer since the 1990s. So at this meeting, we had some updated data from the Caspian study, again, showing small survival benefits. And also from the first line pembrolizumab study from Keynote 604, again, small survival advantage for giving a platinum doublet and adding in an, an immunotherapy drug. Thoughts? Is it now standard of care that we need to give all patients checkpoint inhibitor with their chemotherapy up front? So I think the real challenge, and I think you've highlighted it beautifully, is the magnitude of benefit, particularly for survival. We know that about 10 to 15% of our patients with small cell lung cancer are responsive to checkpoint inhibitors, whether it's upfront with chemotherapy, whether it's subsequently as a single agent. The challenge is who are these patients? And so I think the Keynote 604 study and the update to Caspian just really speak to the fact that there's a small group within that larger group of small cell lung cancer patients that could derive such benefit. And we still don't know who they are. It's not tumor mutation burden. It's not PDL1. Could it be autoantibodies? You know, we just don't know. And that's the challenge. If money were boundless, and in some countries it seems to be, everybody could get immunotherapy. In Australia, you have much more money than we do. Uh, in Canada, it's not been reimbursed because you know the concern really is that with that low level of activity, with that very small population hidden in there, we just can't justify spending for the whole population. So, as someone, if I had small cell lung cancer, I would want immunotherapy, and I'm so glad it's reimbursed in Australia. But it's so important to remember that the chance of, of really driving benefit is one in ten. One and eight, you know, it's still very low. So it's going to be a real challenge. Yeah, thank you very much. So we're going to switch track now and talk a little bit about targeted therapy. But one of the main or most interesting papers from the, the whole meeting was the adjuvant study involving osimertinib for the EGFR mutated patients. So this was a very interesting study. I know uh, people around the world participated, including in Australia and Canada. And it looked at patients with resected 1B, stage 2, and 3 disease, and patients either got osimertinib at a dose of 80 milligrams for three years or placebo. The primary endpoint, sadly, was disease-free survival, and the uh, Data Safety Committee made a recommendation to terminate the study uh, and blind patients based on the disease-free survival outcomes, which again is unfortunate because survival is really what matters, uh, particularly in Canada and Australia. So there, there were a third of patients at each stage, about 55% got adjuvant chemotherapy and, uh, was stratified for the, and uh, this was well balanced between the groups. And the disease-free survival benefit, the hazard ratio was 0.21, so about an 80% redu reduction in the risk of relapse. Uh, at three years, the, the median disease-free survival was not reached in the osimertinib arm versus about 28 months in those on placebo. And as you went up by the stages, you know, the numbers looked more and more favorable with the addition of adjuvant osimertinib. There was an early look at survival. At two years, 93% of patients were alive in the placebo, placebo arm and 100% in the osimertinib arm. So that's 7%. It's not statistically significant. It's very exciting. Uh, but that for us is, is where the money is. And, you know, I thought Dave Spiegel gave a really great discussion where he talked about, are we curing this or are we delaying relapse? 
uh, and could these patients do just as well after they relapse? And again, you know, it's a real struggle. It's not like breast cancer. Uh, lung cancer has been much more rooted in survival. Uh, Disease-free survival has not been considered a surrogate for overall survival yet. So it's been a real challenge. You know, there's this huge relapse-free survival benefit. Does that change? Does that translate into cure? I think we still don't know. I think we're hoping it is. I'm quite sure in the U.S. this will be approved for routine use. Uh, I, ho- I hope these patients mm-hmm. will all still get chemotherapy because this group still did derive benefit from imaginable from even even with chemotherapy. But for us in Australia and Canada, you know, does it cure patients? And this will be the challenge. Again, as a patient, I probably want my adjuvant osimertinib. Uh, It was very well tolerated. Only about 11% of patients stopped uh, during the three years. But again, you know, does this cure? That's an open question and remains very important. Great. Lastly, I picked a paper because this looks quite interesting. It's only phase two data, but there's quite a, a lot of interest in this new treatment in other tumors as well. Uh, and that's trastuzumab deruxtecan, which is an antibody drug conjugate with a HER2 antibody and a topo isomerase 1 inhibitor payload. So really quite interesting data in a difficult group of patients. These are patients who predominantly had failed platinum-based chemotherapy, failed IO, and then received this drug in phase 2 with high response rates. And uh, I think it's a drug that we may hear more about in the future. And I agree, you know, currently in my clinic, this is a group of patients where there is such unmet need. Uh, You know, a lot of these patients are non-smokers. You know, as we increasingly expand our genotyping, we'll find a lot of these patients with HER2 insertion mutations. uh, And the challenge is, what can we give them? We've seen data on Afatinib, TDM1, and different agents. But uh, unfortunately, the real world experience has not been as good. So to see a 64% response rate with this compound is so exciting. And uh, I think we're really looking forward to future studies. The challenge always is, you know, how big is the subgroup? It's about 2% of our patients. Uh, Do we need to do randomized trials? Is that what we're going to be forced to do in Canada and Australia and in Europe to get this funded? Or or will this be considered uh, a targeted therapy with that same activity uh, and same promise as we've seen in, you know, BRAS1 positive patients, EGFR positive patients, ALP positive patients, and can we fast track development and approval and access for patients? And so these are remaining questions to be answered. I'm very excited about this. All my patients are excited about this. They've all written to me saying, how do we get this drug? Uh, and we're hoping to open, uh, open trials soon. Great. So thank you very much, Natasha. As we said at the start, really quite an exciting group of papers presented ASCO this year. It's an exciting time to be looking after lung cancer patients after many years of quite nihilistic approach. So some exciting times ahead and we look forward to being able to bring these treatments to the everyday patients in our clinic. So thank you again for getting up so early and talking to us in Toronto. We wish you all the best and hopefully we'll talk to you again sometime soon on the oncology podcast thank you so much i look forward to shopping with you at asco next year oh wouldn't that be nice (laughs) so now we're going to turn to a new section in our podcast and this is called winners and losers and of course i'm doing the winners and hands is doing the losers Now, we allocated the topic based on the number of listens to the previous podcast. And in Belgium, we've only had seven listeners, despite Hans telling us that he was some sort of movie star with a huge following on Twitter. So for that, he gets the losers section of ASCO. And I can't wait for Craig to get involved tomorrow where he presents the quirky abstracts from ASCO. And I don't need to tell you why he's been allocated that section. (laughs) Come on, Hans, what's going on? Seven downloads from Belgium. Do you have any friends? At least I have seven friends, which is a good thing, I think. I think my mother has listened to it in Australia more than seven times. It it actually is two friends because he's got two kids, a wife, mum, dad. (laughs) So come on, Belgium. go Belgium. Okay, we'll do our best to have a 100% increase by next week. So we go to 40. A statistically significant increase, please. It's a huge increase. Fantastic. 
So the winners, the winner was molecular target. 17% of patients out of a cohort of 12,000 had a germline mutation with a therapeutic target. And in rare tumours, it was 56%. That's a winner. Ret fusions were winners in thyroid, non-small cell lung cancer, not only with selpicatinib around, but a new drug, pralcetinib. The big winner was the new HER2-targeted trastuzumab deruxetecan, which is a trastuzumab with a payload with a topo-1 inhibitor. And that was a winner not only in breast cancer, which has been published in February this year, but in gastric and esophageal cancer and in colorectal cancer. So watch out for monoclonals with payloads. And the small molecules did really well as well. Tucatinib in HER2-positive brain metastases may well become standard of care. Cholangiocarcinoma, FGFR2 mutations, and a multitude of other mutations, a molecularly targetable disease. TKIs in EGFR mutation lung cancer, in case you slept through Craig's interview with Natasha. And MET with an exon 14 skipping mutation now targetable in non-small cell lung cancer with topotinib. Lots of new names. The PIK3 kinase mutation target, alpelacib, used in combination with fulvestrin in breast cancer, hormone positive, progressing on CDK46 inhibitors. Another winner. So I think the winners, the era of molecular targeting treatment, lots of new names to learn, difficult to pronounce, more and more specialised therapies. And now for the losers, Hans Prennan. So thank you, Eva, to give me this section about the losers. Actually, you call them losers? Snappy snappy heads. Okay, let me go to Google Translate what you mean by snappy then. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) So the losers... In breast cancer, I selected three studies, one in the metastatic setting, stage four breast cancer patients, whether they should get surgery or not. And actually the study did not show a difference in survival. So they should not get surgery when they are diagnosed with metastatic disease upfront. Another study in the adjuvant setting, HER2 positive disease, there was a question whether TDM1 should be given together with pertuzumab versus trastuzumab, pertuzumab, taxanes. And actually, adjuvant trastuzumab plus pertuzumab plus chemo remains the standard of care in high-risk HER2-positive disease. Then also, there was a very large study of 2,000 patients in HER2-positive ductal carcinoma in situ. The question whether they should uh, get also trastuzumab together with radiotherapy and was also a negative study, so there is no place for trastuzumab in that setting. 2,000 patients, that's going to go into the craziest abstracts tomorrow. Such a low event rate, that's why. Indeed, you're right, Eva. Craig didn't understand the abstract as usual. So let's focus now a little bit on GI. I selected two loser papers. One is the celecoxib, and this is something which Eva likes a lot because she's into the adjuvant studies in colon cancer, but she's selecting aspirin, I guess. So the study asked whether celecoxib, in addition to standard adjuvant therapy with Folfox in stage 3, could lead to DFS. There was no difference in DFS. Enroll your patients in ASCOL. We're still open and aspirin different, so don't get turned off. Yes, indeed. 100% right, Eva. So finally, in GI, which was a negative study, and I didn't really expect it, but it was in esophageal adenocarcinoma, HER2 positive, treated with the CROSS protocol, so chemoradiotherapy, where they added trastuzumab, but there was no benefit of adding trastuzumab to chemoradiotherapy in this disease. So this was my loser section for today. Thank you very much. Now, uh, when Craig said to hurry up, it reminded me that uh, many of the ASCO presentations were actually better on one and a half speed or two times, but uh, there were some people who were so fast on one time that you had to slow it down. That's right. That was a little trick for new players, wasn't it, Eva? You could speed up the presentations, which is what you often think when you're watching it live at Chicago, that you could sometimes speed it up. Absolutely. So that's one advantage over virtual. So how many downloads did we have from our second podcast? 927. And how many in Belgium? Eight. So that's 
That's the one to beat. We need more than 16 next week. Out of a population of 1.3 billion, we got three listeners in India. Yes. <laughs> That's quite good. Okay. A lot of room for growth. But seriously, give us some feedback, Twitter, email, or just text your favourite presenter and let us know if these Journal Club podcasts are of value, if you think Craig should talk less, or if you think that Hans' accent is gorgeous. Thank you very much. And we'll see you next week where we have another guest interview, Michael Hoffman on the landmark Lutetium PSMA trial and an upcoming interview about the impact of the geriatric oncology studies at ASCO. Really quite impressive from our own Australian presenter. So until next time, it's bye-bye from Craig. Bye, Eva. Thank you so much, everybody, for listening. And from Hans. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure as usual. You've been listening to the Oncology Podcast. If you enjoyed today's edition and would like to subscribe, head over to our website, oncologynews.com.au and sign up to our newsletter. Thanks for listening.